Yeah, that's right. That's right. Well, well, we. I was with Mark Pack, right? You're what? I was with he Mark was with Pack. Mark Pack oh, yeah, and, yeah. and Mark Pack's boat. We broke up five fish that day. Guess what we used all day long? Carolina rig. Drop shot. That's all no he way. Do. He don't use a drop That's shot. Awesome. Hey, we can't pull. We got to edit that out. <laughs> Pack bait will sue us if we tell people he's throwing a drop shot. He uses a drop shot. I've been in a boat with him before when he's used a drop shot. And it's his go-to when things get to tough, toughen mm -hmm. up a little bit. Yeah. And, I mean, I even had uh, an eight-pound leader on today. Uh, well, we're using 10. Yeah. But every one of ours broke off at the knot. And you talked about a knot a while back. I was using, I changed over to the Aaron Martin's knot from a San Diego jam. And that knot here of lately seems to be blasting longer and not breaking as quick. And I had several of them that break that break in the line instead of at the knot. Okay. So it gets critical on the knot you tie on that, especially when you're using that light of line. And furthermore, you have to have your drag set perfectly because when we use these drops, I'm using rods that are 6 to 12 line rated rods, okay? Now your drag has to be set at one third the tensile strength of the weakest line you're using, which in my case was an 8 pound line. So we're using 2 and a half pounds of drag. And Boy, you can, do, does anybody in, understand what he just we said? Can, we can go into a whole dissertation on how you figure that one out. One third of tensile. What is a tensile strength? Tensile strength of the line. Is that is stuff you put on your Christmas test. tree? That's what you put on your Christmas tree. Tensile <laughs> but, strength. Wait a minute. But you use eighty pound test on everything, so <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna both flip them all. <laughs> <laughs> this is a different world for you. Okay. Okay. And so I'll shut basically, up. your drag has to be set at one third of that. So with what is line, tensile strength? What it's is the it? strength of the line? All right, is okay. the strength of an eight pound test line. The breaking test, test, line. test of the line. Okay, so you gotta and set so it at one third your pounds. You gotta set it at two and a half, three pounds max. Why do you say that? And so, <laughs> quick quick dissertation on how you figure that out. Well, we learned, I saw a video on it many years ago, that you take one of those scales that have the uh, spring-loaded scale that has a slide bar on it. You fasten it to something like that, you tie this line on to it, you back up about 20, 25 foot, and then you reel up and you set the hook and the drag will slip and then you go over there and look at this spring-loaded scale at what did it move it to, all right? If it goes to four or five, then most of the time you're gonna break it off on the hook set. But you're looking to when you set the hook on that thing and it goes like that and you go back and look, if it's around three pounds, then you memorize what that feels like coming off the, the drag and then you're dialed in. And so over the years, I've learned what 8, 10, 12, you know, feel like. And so I can set the, reel, the reels up to where you're, I break off less. Put it that way. Billy's lost. I hope y'all paid real good attention to that. This is why I bring guys up like him, because that's a whole lot of smart <laughs> stuff. We because we play the finesse game a lot in that's a lot a, of tournaments that, on a lot of lakes. That's a lot of smart yes, stuff being talked about. a lot of difference, too, as far as like the diameter. Like you'll have one that says it's 6 pounds or 8 pounds. On what now, break? No. I'm brand. Oh, brand, brand, brand. The brand, diameter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Brand name. Yeah. You know, and there's big. some lines that are actually stronger than others. Right, right. And, uh, I mean, uh, I don't know if we, do we go full disclosure telling what kind of line we use? Yeah. Uh, I mean, we've tested lines on Berkeley Line Tester and, you know, and lot to not strengths and yeah, stuff Yeah, say like the brand. That. We'll see if we can get a deal. And, a and I mean, the one I use is uh, the Sniper FC. It is the strongest Sunline. line. Sunline. Sunline. It we is, are accepting sponsorships if you're listening. It is the strongest man. line that I've ever put on a drop shot. And so I've had other lines that I use just on guide guide days or something like that. And I found over time that I use the Sunline tournaments, but I don't necessarily always use it on guide trips. Well, I'm like, ah, because it's more, it's cost, it's not cost effective. Let's put it that way. When you're breaking off a lot or when you're having a lot of issues. And when we use a drop shot a lot and we're getting into some slots, you catch three or four, you've got to retie it, cut it off and tie another one on because all these knots on that will tighten up, tighten up, tighten up to finally it'll break in the knot. So when we go fish any kind of tournament that's a stringer tournament, I'll always take and tie up four extra leaders, all right, and I'll hang them on the carpet in the rod box so that after I've caught three or four fish and then I'll take, cut it off, tie another one on real quick. So in case I do hook an over, I mean, I'm... I'm in good shape. Tell you what, I will say one thing. That Seaguar Red Label 20 pound, we use it on guide trips and tournaments yeah. and whatever because you ain't breaking none of that. And I use it on <laughs> it? No. It's just regular. Oh, He's no, talking no, about no, the red, red label. Red label. I just red use that 20 pound red label for everything. You can't break that. No. You better know how to cast yeah. if you're throwing something kind of light because it's got some memory, yeah. but it's tough. It's Yeah, memory. But I'm using a lot of that because we use. I was trying to make a joke. You didn't even laugh at I it. I wasn't even. No. I was thinking about something else. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you this. I love both of you. Let's say two, two, we'll take the same brand, two different lines. Cigar. I fish yellow label and Viz X cigar. Right. Okay? Right, wrong, or indifferent. That's what I fish. Okay. So let's say 10 pound yellow label and Viz X cigar. 
versus 10 pound Abrazex, I guess it's maroon label cigar. Do you find, I know it says 10 pounds, and I, my mind says 10 pounds is 10 pounds is 10 pounds. Ask him. But do if you, you look on the label and look at the, the, the diameter of that line on the Abrazex, mm -hmm. and it's probably a little bit bigger on the Abrazex, and I actually brought this up this week because we were fishing around some trees in 28 foot of water that are deep trees, yes, right. and we'd stick a three or four or five pounder, and that thing's gonna head to those trees, and we were breaking off a lot of leaders because that line was rubbing in that tree, yeah. and the, the the line that we were using was breaking. I mean, and so I, I was talking to some guys about it, and I think, you know, I'm gonna, I may have to, when I fish this application around these trees, I may have to use a Brazex, something that may be a little bit bigger in diameter, or it may have a, a formula that's built into that, or a coating on it that might be a little bit more abrasion resistant, so that I don't break off as many. When I use big game, see, I use big game on my spools that go down to a swivel. So I'm using regular big game. Big game is insanely strong. Right. It's yeah, insanely strong. Yeah. So I we use the mono on the, the main line for a number one reason, really, number one reason. Not only is it strong, there's another reason. It's but expensive. it's the fact that, it, well, it is expensive, there's three. But the, the thing is the stretch. Yeah. I want the stretch on using a drop shot in case I hook a big fish. I want, if I make a mistake or my client makes a mistake and that stretch and that line is going to save them breaking off. Yeah. And then all I have to worry about is a knots on the fluorocarbon leader that I'm using behind a 35 pound swivel. And I use that swivel for one main reason. When we're flipping boat docks with it or pitching anything, most all drop shots will helicopter going down, especially if you use a cylindrical weight uh -huh. and it'll go down this way. Well, after about an hour of doing that without a swivel on there, what'll end up happening is like it'll start wrapping head. around the tip of the rod. It will drive you nuts. Yep. And so many years ago, we started using a 35 pound pro swivel on there, ended all those problems. So that's just FYI. So the way we do uh, things. Technique specific stuff for this time. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that. I think we're running a swivel and a leader on like fishing a weightless fluke to a, a fluke will spin. Yeah. And so anything to keep from twisting the line. Yeah. So. All right. I think maybe we'll do technique specific stuff now. Okay. I don't know. I thought that's where we were going, and then somebody started talking about finesse fishing, and I got yeah. lost. Uh, <laughs> I got real lost real quick. Well, well you know, so, are they making that, that crankbait yet that dies 40 foot? Because I'm sure you'll have six of them. If I, if you let me get enough line out, I'll get it down there. <laughs> we'll stroll it down there, bud. Um, no, so technique specific stuff, and this is one thing I, I'm gonna kind of talk about it in shallow water, and I and I want you to talk about it everywhere else because, again, Lake Fork specific, we've got this slot limit, and so catching it over, man, yeah, you can try to target it over if that's what you want to do. You can go big fish techniques, try to catch big fish. That's fine if that's what you want to do. I, I might be apt to do that myself if I was fishing this tournament. But if you want to go out and really give yourself cash and some good checks, and there's a lot of good money being paid out in this event, if you want to give yourself the best chance of cash and good checks and maybe more than one, you, you got to target the unders. I mean, you just do. You have to target the unders. So if I'm going back into a grass flat, like my best bait back in the grass has been a chatterbait lately. No surprise to anybody that follows anything I do. I throw a chatterbait religiously. Why? Uh, Actually, Be Hot Delight's been better this week. And the one thing about the chatterbait this specific week is we've the the water has changed a lot. The water temps are really starting to climb. And I've gone over to that uh, impact shad, that fluke style trailer, that jointed fluke style trailer, gives it a faster action. And when the water gets hot, that becomes a a real factor. In fact, yesterday morning we were fishing and had some paddle tails on, and we're getting bit, but they weren't committing. Like they were just hitting it, and weren't getting it. And as soon as we changed to that impact shad, every one that bit we hooked up and we caught several fish on that impact shad trailer yesterday morning. So that's a big deal. But I catch a lot of slot fish, and you gotta remember guys, I'm not tournament fishing or tournament yeah. prepping on Lake Fork. So three to seven pound fish are my sweet spot. Like I wanna catch as many of those as I can. If you get into that grass, if you're gonna fish grass in this particular event, and you're fishing chatterbait, and you find that you are getting slot fish, okay? What you need to do is you need to go more finesse. The deal is with finesse fishing, and this is just a general synopsis of mine. We talked about this before we started. When they're biting good, uh, finesse fishing is not the way to catch bigger fish. It's the way to catch smaller fish. 
when they're not biting good, finesse fishing will catch a little bit of everything. But when they're not biting good, it's not like you're getting a lot of bites because they're not biting good. But finesse fishing is a way to catch anything. Eight pounds, 10 pounds, four pounds, five pounds. You don't know what you're gonna get on tougher days when you finesse fish. Uh, Cause the fish are just more prone to bite a finesse presentation when the bite's tougher. But when they are biting good, you can kind of specifically target bigger fish by throwing bigger fish techniques hollow body frogs, swim baits, chatter baits, stuff like that in the grass is how I would target bigger fish. Uh, not to say you won't catch some good two pounders on a chatter bait, because in that guide sermon, we caught all them 114s and all them barely over twos on a chatter bait. So it does happen. But if you find that you're catching slot fish, I would highly recommend finesse fishing. And if you're gonna finesse fish in grass, there's two ways to do it. One is gonna be a wacky worm. Okay, you're gonna take a, a finesse worm, a six, six inch finesse worm, put a half nail weight in the head, get a little weedless wacky worm hook and you're going to kind of pop that thing in and out of that grass let it fall down in there pop it out of the grass let it fall down in there so the other way to do that is is a texas rig weightless stick bait i like the six inch clout cinco is the popular term for it i really like that clout. it's a little bit thinner you can fish it a little bit more like a jerk bait over that that grass in that shallow water there's not a lot of gap yeah you know what i mean there's not a lot of gap and so I like that bait that I can fish faster. It gives more of a jerk bait action doing all this, whereas the Senko won't do quite as much of that. So when you say grass shallow, you're actually saying submerged grass shallow. Yeah, we're talking grass on the surface shallow. We're not talking about emergent vegetation. We're talking about submergent. Okay. We're talking about hydrilla, coontail, stuff like that. Gotcha. Uh, but I like that clout bait for that when I got, especially when I got to fish it faster, because it's a little bit skinnier, has a little bit more of that jerk bait action when I can fish it faster and twitch it a lot. Um, what about a fluke in the same situation, weightless Texas yeah. rig? Yeah, I, I think I think that a, a weightless Texas rig fluke and a weightless Texas rig five-inch stick bait is almost the exact same yeah. bait. I, know, I think I think most of the fish that are going to bite one are going to bite the other. Yeah. So it's really a personal preference still. Yeah. Um, but the deal is, if they're biting good, go finesse to target those 16-inch and under fish. That's, that's really the deal. And it's really not a bad idea. It's why so many of these guys that finish in the top of these tournaments out here, this guy to my left being one of them that does it all the time, uh, they are really good finesse fishermen. These guys that catch limited unders and pop it over once in a while, man, they are really good at finesse fishing. And so I'm interested to hear David's take on that about when they're biting good, the finesse fishing will target the, the unders. What do you think? When he and I were back there in that location, uh, 50 yards apart, I could see what he was throwing. And my logic to this was, was that being as this format, the way that it was, I wanted to catch more numbers than he caught. So I was throwing a smaller plastic that had action on the tail in order to get more bites. I was after the two to three pounders rather than the bigger ones. Well, I got lucky and did catch a seven pounder in there. Mm -hmm. But I, my, my thought train on that was, I thought that they're gonna quit hitting that chatterbait as the morning grows on. Not to hit you your bait away or anything. And they'll stay hitting the finesse plastic. I mean, I give it away, it's on camera. And the and the, 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 the plastic which would ask, actually last longer for more bites. And that was my tournament logic for that day. And that's the reason why I chose to go that route, was to actually try to catch more numbers of smaller fish. And now he's got a chance with that bait to catch more six pounders in there, yeah. if they'll bite it. But I was, betting on the fact that as the morning progressed that and that, that gonna, day that, that wasn't going to be the case that day of that guy's sermon was not a good bite like they did not bite good that day and, and any other day and i've been fishing that spot for almost a month straight in the morning every morning yeah. and that was probably the second or third worst morning i'd had in there as far as the average size of fish i was catching uh for whatever reason they just didn't bite as good as they had but i, I probably should have gone more finesse that day I mean, as it was, I was in there a little bit longer than David was. I got there earlier. We came out of there pretty even when it was all said and done. Um, yeah, because I was able to recover in there with that smaller bait, Yeah. And I recovered fairly He definitely, quick. I had the lead and then he caught me. And I caught him up. Yeah. And, and I was jabbing yeah. him all along. Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> and I was calling him a whole buzzard the whole time because I was there first. <laughs> it wasn't, he didn't do anything wrong. I'm not saying that, but I was giving him a hard time calling him a whole buzzard all day. So right now, even the, the, with that pattern, you not even small swim baits on under he underspin or something. You like can throw swim bait on a big that. jig head out and deep. I'm using that. I was currently using that for the first thirty minutes of the morning. But well, I was catching too big a fish. Yeah, yeah. and I don't. That's why I, I I got away from it. Because and, and you can, there is a swim bait bite in deeper water right now. 
There is. Yeah. Especially if you pull up over a spot where the fish are a little bit more scattered and spread out, they're not quite as grouped up as you want them to be. You can take a swim bait on. You can either do a small swim bait on like a half ounce jig head, or you can do a bigger swim bait on a three quarter one ounce jig head. Uh, mm -hmm. I really like the hollow bodies for those. Um, and I also like the paddle tails, a little divine swim bait for six inch, little paddle tails, solid body paddle tails uh, on the smaller ones, on the half ounce head, because I can, that, that, that uh, solid body paddle tail, I can swim a lot slower. Yeah, you can slow I can keep it in their face longer. And when these fish are kind of spread out, suspended, they tend to be a little more lethargic, a little less apt to, to really get aggressive and come chase something down and bite it. So having that swim bait that I can kind of slow roll through there, here's the big key about a swim bait, they follow it. This is why I think this works so good in that spread out scenario. And I actually just did a Guides Network episode that's gonna air Wednesday about this exact topic. When I find fish that are spread out a little bit on this, or maybe they're off the side of the structure, something like that, just a little bit more scattered than I want them to be. When I throw that swim bait in there and I swim it through them, I, I believe some of them follow it because that's what bass do with swim baits. They follow it. Even when they don't bite it, they follow it. And as they follow it, they kind of start to group up. Yeah. And then that competitive deal kicks in and you get one of them to bite. And then once you got one of them to bite and you got them gathered, now it's on. Yeah, well you can now it's on. Fired up, fired up. Yeah, now, now you can go ahead and catch them because, you know, we sat on a school yesterday and we probably threw that swim bait for a good 20 minutes, 30 minutes maybe without a bite. And then we got one to bite. And then once we got one to bite, it's like the whole school followed him to the boat. Yeah. And then about five minutes later, another one bit. And then once that second one bit, it was like every cast. And we, and we, we sat on the spot for an hour, an hour and a half. And I mean, just never went more than probably five or 10 minutes without catching one. I mean, we absolutely struggled. Now these were no good for your tournament. Yeah. They were all like four to five, six pounds, you know. I call them trash fish. But it sure was a lot of fun. <laughs> that string got stressed, I know that. But but I really think that, and that so that, that jig head on an offshore swim bait bite is effective in the right scenario right now. And it can kind of take some fish that might not bite much anything else and kind of make them bite. If you're, if you're methodical enough with it and patient enough with it. Yeah, let me paint a scenario for you. <laughs> 28 and a half foot of water. Grass off the bottom, up to 15 feet. There's no such thing here. I'm not answering unless you give me coordinates. There's no such <laughs> thing here. <laughs> if you got grass, and, no grass if you got grass and 28 foot of water, I'm not answering unless you give me coordinates. Yeah, I'd have to see that to believe it. Uh, not on this lake. Not on this lake. No. That grass got torn out and just drifted down there. Yeah, I ain't no way. I'll talk to you after. <laughs> <laughs> So one thing I do I do want to get to with you, David, is kind of the principle I was talking about, about how finesse fishing can help you target these unders. When, when the fish are actually kind of biting a little bit and you're catching a few, but you're catching slot fish, can you can you finesse fish and get the unders on the on the more main lake stuff that you spend a lot more time well, on? Well, especially early, because this morning was an interesting scenario. I had, I put two different colors of little small swim baits on for these guys. And when we started at 6, Oh, three or whatever it was and the young man had a darker swim bait on than his dad did and he caught I mean he caught him just like that bang 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 and his dad's going what is going on here you know and it took probably a little while after that probably another 10 minutes after that when it lightened up a little bit more then all of a sudden he catches one on the lighter wider bait which I thought was kind of unusual. When it was a little bit darker, that other bait that had a darker back, a little bit dark, darker profile to it, got those bites earlier. So the amount of light penetration that goes into that water, and I mean, those, it actually has an effect on the way those fish bite. So if you're throwing the wrong bait, wrong color, I just believe at some point in time, when that light changes, there's gonna be a window there when those fish are gonna hit it. You could be in the right and if you place, got, right scenario, if you got good at it color. and could change and adapt, I mean, these there's guys on that tour yeah. out there that know how to do this, and they say with this amount of light, there's a cloud cover, whatever the case. I mean, these guys are constantly changing, yeah. and so they know this and they can adapt that fast. Yeah, it's, it's the details, may, right? So we earlier, camp on one color yeah. and never change it. Earlier, David was talking about the details of you know where'd you get the bite, how'd you get the bite, when'd you get blah blah blah, all that stuff. It, it's these details, these details or what makes better fishermen. If somebody asks me, what can I do to become a better fisherman? My first answer is pay more attention to every little thing. I mean, to every little thing. How many people do you know that would even notice what he's talking about to that detail? If you want to get better at fishing, you got to notice those details. You got to notice 
How hard did I? How hard did I pop it out of that grass when he bit that chatterbait, or did he not hit the grass at all before he bit the chatterbait? You got to know every little detail, make every little adjustment. That's the way to become a better fisherman. This whole deal is a process of elimination. This whole game is a process of elimination. Well, they're not biting the white one right now. They're biting the dark one. Oh, 10 minutes later, they're not biting the dark one. They're biting the white one. Well, if you can be the guy that makes that adjustment like David just talked about, that's how you get next level, right? Because now you catch them all. And so it's the details. Pay it, you know, especially as you're going through tournament preparation. Every little detail becomes so important because you need to know all the information for the next day to make the right adjustments on the next day. You got to know that. So, like, if David goes out and fishes tomorrow morning, he's probably going to start out for the first, how long you say the dark swim bait? How long dark 30 swim? 30 minutes, 45 minutes. So, he's going to have, so if he's got two customers tomorrow morning, he's going to have two dark swim baits on for 30 minutes. Yeah. Then all of a sudden, he's going to change them to white swim baits. And they're going to be like, why are you changing them? We're catching them. Don't worry about it, folks. I got this. They're going to start catching them on the white swim baits. And they're going to be like, David is the most amazing fisherman I've ever been in the boat with. Well, it's because he paid attention to details. And the timing, too, because the day we fished that guide tournament that day, he started us at 7 o'clock. And I was cussing him because I wanted to start at six o'clock because I knew I could catch some good ones at six o'clock. I well, just wanted to sleep. Yeah, I figured that. <laughs> and so I, th I told the guy, the guys I was fishing with, I said, you know, this is a little bit of a handicap, but I think we're going to go to this spot. And I rigged up a white one on it, and I put an underspin. And the reason why I did that is because I actually wanted a bigger bite. All right. And so we went to that spot, and sure enough, we're throwing up there, and pretty quick, boom, boom. So he caught two he, or three pounds. Yeah, he had, he had two two pounders before I I even got to my first spot. Yeah, he and did. So we caught those really quick. Two and a half pounds, both of them were. And so uh, then it was absolutely shot off after that. We did not get another bite after it. So I didn't know that I handicapped you that bad. I'm really glad that I you did. You handicapped me really bad. I'm really glad that I did. <laughs> yeah, but uh, you handicapped me by making it to where we couldn't keep everything. It would could have been ugly if we could have kept everything. Like under two pounds? Yeah. Well, I had plenty of them too. Oh, I had a lot. Well, I had a lot of them. <laughs> so, yeah, we caught a lot of them small. But it fish. was fun. And I mean, but that type of adjustment, and I mean, I bought an extra 30 minutes by going that way on that spot, which I knew that I really, you know, I bought was on borrowed time uh, by making that adjustment. But then as soon as we got done with that, I wanted to hit another spot. When I got over there, there was a boat sitting there. I told him I wouldn't be over there spot till nine o'clock. Well, lo and behold, I show up there at quarter to eight. Because that's somebody, why I called him a whole buzzer. Somebody was sitting on my we knew We knew we were going to the same area, and we had talked that morning before we took off. And when I found out, I found out either that morning or the night before, I don't remember. Right. But I found out he was going to that same area I was going to. So I went to talk to him about it, just to be like, hey, just so you know, I'm going to be there too, you know. And uh, I said, I'm starting there. He goes, oh, well, I won't be there till 9 o'clock. I said, good, that's about when I'll be leaving. So it'll work out. Then he showed up like an hour hour and a half earlier than he was supposed to and i was like whoa 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 hold on <laughs> oh, <somebody said laughs> wait a minute my, my but i told him on this till nine i told him full disclosure i only fish that spot in tournaments yeah and that's yeah. what i told him we already this year and and the tournaments we got to fish even before uh corona started uh we, we were in that same exact spot uh earlier in the year even and so that's about the time i only go in that spot usually in tournaments because of the fact that unders good unders live there yeah. Good unders live there, and they always are there. And that's exactly and that's, yeah. That's over there by the damn it's on the Fish Life app. Go subscribe. Fish Life app is going. Go subscribe. Uh, yes, yeah, sir. Would, I mean, would you rather like target for a bait fish, ball to shad, or or say white? Man, I'm gonna tell you on, on on this lake here. On this lake here, there's so much bait in it. Okay. I don't really worry about what type of bait fish there are. I just worry about finding bass. And, and the reason I say that is, if you go graphing around here, you won't hardly go. There's very few places out here you can go on this lake and not see some form of life. So I think these fish on this lake are the definition of opportunistic feeders. I think they'll eat a yellow bass. I think they'll eat a crappie. I think they'll eat a small sand bass, a bluegill, a shad. You know, the only time of year, the only times of year that I really get bait specific in the fall, it's all shad for me. In the spring, it's a lot of bluegill, except for the big swim bait deal, which is a shad deal. But you know, most of the fish in the spring, other than that one specific deal, are bluegill related. And so I will change my colors, change my presentations to represent those baits in the spring and fall. Summer and winter, I think they're eating whatever comes by. And so, you know, they may be on a big ball of shad, but you can throw that green pumpkin fluke down there on a Carolina rig and get a bite. You know what I mean? So I think they're just opportunistic. I'll follow, I'll graph and look and see if I can find the barfish 
on certain spots, if I can see barfish or small sand bass, it's a good way to target real big spot, fish. Yeah. And that's when I'm going to end up fishing that area right there because that's exactly what those big bass eat is those little yellow bass and white bass that are real small. Primarily more than so than shad? Uh, well, I mean, there might not be shad in the area. I mean, I've seen balls of shad in some of these places lately. They're suspended. The balls of shad are almost always suspended. Yeah. But those sand bass and barfish that you can find areas where the graph shows little bitty arcs yeah. on the bottom, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. exactly what that is. I mean, they 100%. And I'll, and I'll take time to throw to them. The bigger fish 100% love eating those barfish. Yes. Out. They're the perfect size. They don't get much bigger in your hand. And those big seven, eight plus pound fish love eating, even the five pounders, yeah. love eating those yellow bass for sure. But make no mistake, when that group of shad drifts down on that point, they'll eat that shad too. Or you know what I mean? Or when that gizzard shad comes up, like they'll, they're very opportunistic most of the year out here. And we had fish today. Matter of fact, back there where you were, I mean, they actually were coming up schooling. Uh, small fish were schooling. Today we had two opportunities, and if we'd have been rigged up for it, I mean, they come up schooling around us in a couple of areas today. And uh, they were, these were black bass too, busting some shad. We saw one yeah, that they when it's a big when it's calm, shad. when it's it calm, calm, they'll chase. And he busted yeah. a big gizzard shad out of the water. That yeah, when like, it's calm back in there, they'll get to schooling a little yeah, bit. It's yeah. fun. So, I love throwing a flutter spoon. I mean, I'm always gonna have one this time. Yeah, on. and that works. Yeah, there's been some flutter spoon bites to be had a little bit, a little bit here and there. It's kind of spotty, you know, not every day, but they will. The flutter spoon bite will get better, even better when the water gets hotter. And when we get into August and September. Yeah, that's true. And even, I love it in October, November too, in yeah. fall, big flutter spoon. These guys went and got the air conditioner and pulled it up to, <laughs> <laughs> it is hot. Nothing. The, where the he places are, stuff. where oh. the hot spots are on this lake. No. <laughs> he just gave away the best three secrets, man, you missed it. I was giving away coordinates while you were gone. There you go. All right, do we have any questions? Anybody over here got any questions? Jared, how you doing, man? I seen you. Yeah, go, I, I seen you driving down the lake today. I, I got. I don't. I don't accept questions from you though. No, go ahead. How many times do you think it's too many times to go over a point graphing? If you find a little group of fish, maybe you missed them that first time. You have to turn around and try to come back to better identify them. You think you're no. You know, it's 25, I, 30 foot of water. I don't think it hurts too bad. I don't so, think it hurts. I don't, I, I'm probably one, I'm, I might be the most thorough grapher when it comes to these guys out here do it. A lot of the guys that I know will, a lot of times they'll graph it, they see a school they like on the first pass, they're going to stop, hit spot lock, turn around and throw, and then uh, and some guys will maybe go a second time and confirm it, but man, I'm going to start zigzagging a point, you know, if the point's running like this, I'm going to zigzag this point, and I'm going to mark, I'm going to zigzag, because I want to know where every fish around that point is. I'm trying to mark fish icon waypoints around every little group of fish and draw a map of where every fish is sitting. So I'll go like this, wide berth up and down. And then I'll go like this. So he's making a grid. So I actually make a big grid, make sure I don't miss anything. I mark every fish. Once I've done all that, I zoom out on my map, kind of see the shape. Because a lot of times, most of the time, this school of fish will be laid out in a certain angle. They'll be more long one way than they are. They're not often just going to be perfect circle, right? A lot of times they'll be kind of elongated this way or this way or whatever have you. Well, I want to set, if that group of fish is sitting like this, I want to set my boat up on one of these ends. It's where I can make a cast and keep my bait in the school the entire time. So if, if I sit over here and I make a cast, I can keep my bait in the school this whole time. But if I'm sitting over here, I can only keep my bait in the, in the school for half the amount of time. So I want to have a full map. So I don't think there is such a thing as too many times. Now, Lake Fork specific, if it's a small school and you keep going over them on Lake Fork, because of the boat traffic we get, because of modern electronics and technology and how many people are fishing offshore structure, especially if you start getting under 20 foot, you do run the risk on this lake of running those fish off. So if you see a small school, you might not graph them as much. If you go over and you start seeing a big school of fish, don't worry about it. Ain't all of them leaving. All of them aren't leaving. It's not happening. And then once you stop and start fishing, the ones that did leave will come back. You know? so. Uh, I'm really, really thorough. I want to know where every fish on that or anywhere around that piece of structure is sitting. That way I can say, okay, we got a school over here and a little wad over here. We can make some casts here. They ain't biting anymore. Let's hit this before we move. Like, I want to know where everything is. I want all, like, if you read a book, you don't want to skip pages. You need all the information. Same deal here. I want to know where everything is on this one. You do? It goes faster? It goes faster. <laughs> How thorough are you when you graph? 
I'm not as thorough as you. And I, I know. I had that happen today, what he's talking about, where I graphed over a spot and I saw him, and I turned around, I wanted to go back and check on either side of it, and I didn't see on either side, so I lined back up in the middle, and uh, they weren't there again. They bounced on you. So they that will happen on this lake. And I, I looked all around there, and they were gone. And I marked, you know, five or six, what I thought were good ones, enough that I would throw to, and then they moved on. So, yeah, the other lakes around here, I, I never have that issue, even in like 12 foot of water, but they just don't really, they stay on the structure. But out here, man, they get so many boats going over them. They've probably been thrown at, a couple of them probably been caught. And, and they just get a, a lot more skittish on Lake Fork than they do these other lakes in East Texas, it seems like. Yeah, that big fish my client caught today was, uh, it'd already been caught. Had a yeah. hole right here. <laughs> a lot of these fish get caught. Yeah. I mean, it's you get a day like today, we had a whole lot of boats on the water, everybody out here looking around for this tournament. And I mean, I drove from one of this lake to the other and saw like three offshore structure spots that I wanted to fish that didn't have a boat on it. Like there's so many boats. You know, the, these maps now and everything are so good. That, man, there's just not much that people aren't gonna find anymore. Yeah. You know, it, it's gotta be something really subtle and out of the way for other people to not find it. And there were so many people fishing offshore structure. It was super hot, super calm day. You know, so it, it lended itself to everybody fishing offshore anyway, because a lot of times if you get a windy enough day, it'll knock some of them people off the main lake, and that can kind of be some of your better days offshore because there's not as many people out there. Um, there's a lot of stuff getting fished hard. Fishermen are better than they used to be. You know, it, I, I thought that today as I was driving around looking at some of the stuff people were fishing, and I know these aren't locals because we're out here enough. We, we know most of the people that are out here every day. And I was thinking that in my head was like, man, Five years ago, for sure, 10 years ago, there's no chance any of these guys knew about that, 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 and that. And now everybody knows about it. You know? Do you have a question, Gutty? Sure. Um, if you caught a fish, like you, David, you were talking about That's when you measure you push that though. fish up so it's just uh, bump you up. All right. If you caught a fish, you know it's 23 three quarters. It's been caught a dozen times because it's got holes. It's got a busted jaw. The jaw's pushed out. When I push them against the scale, it comes back to 23 and 3 quarters. If I don't push against the scale where it's busted, then it's re healed. And now he's 24 and an 8. Remember what, it's, remember it's what David said. Remember what David said. If you've got a fish that's questionable, no matter the reason, what's that guy's job? To make it illegal. Okay. That, and that's to keep them from being held liable for anything like that. So if there's any way that it will go illegal, that guy over there at that yeah. weigh scale, he's going to make it illegal. It cost us $1,000 in a tournament one time because we had a, a 238 under that was good over on one side and about a 16th under on the other side. And so I thought, well, this is going to be a good fish. And whenever we got to the weigh-in, and he, when he put it up there, he put the belly away. And I said, no, 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 turn it over. Put the belly towards you. He said, no, we don't do that. We always weigh them all belly away. Does it say that in the rules? But, you know, I mean, that was a long time ago, too. And so things have changed, obviously. But, you know, I mean, when he clarified that and said, it's our job to make the fish illegal if possible. So that answered that question. And every one of these hourly tournaments, there will be several people that will get a ticket. Oh, yeah. For bringing an illegal fish on this. It's just this unique deal of slot limit. So. Yeah. Man, that's been a, a good seminar, man. Thank you guys all for staying. I know it's super hot out here. I appreciate it. Actually, I'm going to talk to Ken and Dana and see what we can do about maybe moving in the air conditioning two weeks from now. David, great job. All right, young Thank man. Thank you, you for coming. Uh, Thank Lake Fork Marina. Just keep talking. Just keep talking. <laughs> You're good now. You want to keep going now. They got the truck, got the air on. Now they want us to keep going. Hey, we appreciate it. We'll see you all in two weeks, man. Thank you.